Okay, there we go. Starting at the beginning instead of the end. So <clears throat> this is be a this will be a little bit of a, a walk down memory lane for me. Um, I've been involved in coagulation testing. Um, and really the father of TEGs for heart surgery for the better part of 38 years now going on 40 years. And again, on the left, you can see a bunch of suggested readings and stuff, which nobody can read from here, but it'll all come to you in slides if anybody wants to download them. Um, and they're some of the key literature that's out about TEGs. And now um, what I'm going to end up with is discussing a brand new technology, um, which I'm proud to have been partially related to. Um, but, you know, patients bleeding in heart surgery, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> is complex. I have no doubt about that. <coughs> that's a profound, that's a profound understatement. And I will say to you that um, our standard lab systems <coughs> have still failed us, even though TEG is better than PT, PTTs and stuff. And so the real, the real way to improve <clears throat> our patient care is to have a point of care test that's near real time and in deep enough depth that tells us something that's actionable. In other words, something that you and I can see within five or 10 minutes, uh, <clears throat> about the same speed as what we would get in ACT. And out of that, can we get information that then we can act upon um, and um, yeah, I mean, the, the blood banks, if we have to wait for platelets and stuff, that can be a problem, but um, we'll get to all that. So, <coughs> excuse me, uh, no doubt, don't worry, I don't have COVID. I just choked. So no doubt, um, blood, blood coagulation is extremely complex. And then if you throw on top of it, the complexity of heart surgery, um, you have a morass of which none of us can comprehend. And so when none of us can comprehend things, we do all, all kinds of really stupid, crazy ass stuff. <coughs> so this is a, a key article and one that I <coughs> sometimes am now quoting where they've tried to create, um, if you will, a, a, a silicon model or a computer model of coagulation. And you find out that there's 150 to 800 different reactions feeding forward and backwards all at the same time. So when the surgeon leans over and looks at me and says, hey, species, bleeding. Why is he bleeding? Fix the bleeding. I'm like, well, I don't know. You know, beats the hell out of me. I've been doing this for 40 years. And in this particular case, it could be one of, of 800 things. What would you like me to treat? So, um, but, in all honesty, we'll get closer to making some rationality out of it. So really the future of what we're going for is probably an artificial intelligence, something that can take these various different um, reactions and put some sanity to them. <clears throat> so one of the, this believe it or not, is my most widely quoted paper out of everything in my CV. And this came out in 1995, and at the time I didn't think it was all that great of a paper, but obviously some people think it is. And what we did was we started using thromboelastography to decide whether patients should go back from the ICU for bleeding after heart surgery. And the bleeding rate for heart surgery at that time at the University of Washington was about 5.3% of all comers. And by doing TEGs and by intervening, we could take it down to 1.2%. And that was huge. And you know why it was huge? Because the surgeons could sleep at night. And having, and having a 4% improvement in sleepiness for the surgeons was probably one of the best outcomes we could possibly come back. And yeah, I mean, it saved money and everything else. And we saved in blood products and blah, blah, blah. But <clears throat> in the end, it was we took fewer and fewer patients back to the ICU, from the ICU back to the operating room because we put one little tiny bit of sanity one tiny bit of sanity into what was otherwise a totally insane um, seat of your pants technology. Here's another one I published, 2009. This gets a fair amount of um, press. A little coagulation knowledge is dangerous. And <clears throat> the reason I wrote this is because um, people were giving FFP after heart surgery. 
I will tell you in five years, I have not given a unit of FFP to a heart surgery patient, period. Ipso fatso, not going to happen in my operating room. And <clears throat> there are reasons for that. And so um, this was a case report in Canada where somebody gave um, FFP and the patient got, um, pa patient got ARDS or got trolley immediately after the FFP and went on to die. And the lungs just filled up with fluid. And <clears throat> the reason that they gave him the FFP it was because that's what they always do. It's not because they had any data whatsoever. And so I was just on a panel not a couple of months ago. Oh, I was up in, I was up um, consulting with a, with a drug company in New Jersey about, um, and there were 12 anesthesiologists and surgeons sitting around a table. And one of the guys from a very, very well-respected cardiac surgery program, who's a, who's a world-class cardiac anesthesiologist said, well, we give everybody FFP after surgery. I'm like, really? Oh, dear God. And it's exactly what Ty said is, you know, how can we get, how can we get people to actually make some sense? So here's what drives you crazy. Don't pay any attention to it, but we got to show it because this is what drives everybody crazy. And this is what none of us can understand. And so there's probably 50 arrows on there, but imagine, imagine if there were 800 arrows and <clears throat> there are so many things that aren't on that chart. And every one of those arrows happens simultaneously. And every one of those arrows is sort of drawn in one direction because that's the way somebody wanted to draw it for a textbook. But every one of those arrows, I guarantee you, goes in both directions because there's feedback loops and there's complexity. And the beauty about Mother Nature is the complexity. And that's what keeps me going in what I work in is really getting to the weeds about the complexity. 150 to 800 simultaneous reactions with instant feedback. And you can't know which ones are going in which direction. For example, the intrinsic pathway, which we have always accepted as the cause of that horrible thing, the bypass machine that has all that, all that surface area that triggers all kinds of bad reactions, that's horse manure. But yeah, it's got a, but you know what, you know what triggers the bad reactions in heart surgery is the extrinsic pathway um, and tissue factor. And it's tissue factor and it's ischemia reperfusion injury of the microcirculation, not your bypass machine. I can tell you that. I can tell you that unequivocally. All right, so uh, photomicrograph platelets hanging around a red cell. Yeah, red cells, red cells are absolutely important for coagulation. Thromboxane has to be handled through a red cell before it gets handed off to a platelet. Look at those tiny little fibrils. Those are fibrin. What are they attached to? They're attached to the red cell. The red cell actually has 2B3A binding sites on its surface, not as many as a platelet does, but it reacts the same as does a platelet. So, so many of, so many of our misunderstandings are from, frankly, ignorance. And so now we know, <clears throat> we know that coagulation isn't just a protein event, it's a cellular event but it's a cellular event controlling proteins and the control of those proteins are on the surface of cells at very specific glycoprotein binding sites. And it's a very highly orchestrated group of things happening together. It doesn't happen in your plasma. Your plasma doesn't just spontaneously coagulate. Your plasma has proteins that interact with the cell surfaces, and yeah, you got to have normal platelets. But it's not just it's not just how many platelets have you got, how much fibrinogen have you got, how much von Willebrand's factor have you got. It's about flow, and it's about geometry, and it's about diffusion. And so, of course, in our laboratory values, and even in our best TEGs, or the new one that I'm going to talk to you about, the Hemasonics machine. We don't have normal flow and we don't have normal endothelial cells. So we don't have normal feedbacks, abnormal feedbacks. We don't have any of those things. And <clears throat> lo and behold, the red cells interacting with the surface of endothelial cells is highly important for what inflammation signals get put off by those endothelial cells. The shear modulus is really, really super important. 
And any number of any number of groups, including STS and AMSECT and Perfusion, um, and others have recommended a number of different um, implementations of patient blood management. And in every one of them, they recommend that we do something to do with multidisciplinary stakeholders all getting together. There's my shared mental model of saying, everybody, let's get it together and let's understand how we're going to, um, how we're going to approach bleeding patients. And the, the approach to bleeding patients in the STS guidelines that also had Perfusion International Consortium of Evidence-Based Perfusion was in there and they said, you know, a viscoelastic test is vital for you to be able to take care of your patients bleeding after heart surgery. So how many, how many heart surgery places in the United States use viscoelastic testing? About the same number that you do patient blood management, about 30%. 70% still throw their hands up in the air when I go and talk to them and say, we don't know how to deal with bleeding. I'm like, dear God, just, you know, just embrace something that makes some sense. <clears throat> so um, routine coagulation testing is wrong. I think basing PTs, PTTs, um, and such, um, even platelet counts, either together or uh, individually, is gonna lead you down wrong paths. Um, PT and PTTs have nothing to do with factor 13 cross-linking. 90% of thrombin generation occurs after these tests are done. And so viscoelastic testing, at least if you're doing TEG or Rotem, continue on for a, for a period of time, 45 minutes or so, so you can get to see what happens as the thrombin burst um, occurs and, and goes on and on. Yes, you can improve transfusion behavior by following PTs and PTTs, but you do that by a process of elimination rather than actually trying to um, attack it head on. That's a, that's a repeat. So <clears throat> I think it's also important for us to remember that clot formation is the first part of inflammation. Oh, interesting. And what's the first part of clot formation? Platelet activation. Platelets are primarily an inflammatory cell. Platelets are the first cells to attack and to ingest bacteria. Hmm. Again, nobody thinks about that. But that's what they are there for, and they are there as the early warning, the scouts, to go signal and say, hey, let's get over here, um, let's get ratcheted up, let's do something. And so... <clears throat> um, Clot formation is dynamic. And here's another thing that falls down. You and I draw an ACT. We draw a TEG. We send off something to the lab. Okay, that was an hour ago. How much has things changed since then? It's a dynamic process. We may have been on and off bypass twice. We may have cooled and rewarmed. We may have had your friendly anesthesiologist give any number of drugs, um, epinephrine, norepinephrine, all of which affect um, blood coagulation, and um, gee, I gave a cephalosporin. What's the most? What's perhaps the most profound antiplatelet drug we give in heart surgery? A cephalosporin. Anybody ever give cephalosporin? Yeah, you focus all the time about you know make sure they're not on any of those antiplatelet agents. Then the surgeon says, "What are we going to give for an antibiotic today?" Oh, we're going to give a cephalosporin. Oh, good that, you know, beta blockers, profoundly antiplatelet. How many times do you give beta blockers? Oh, it's now STS required that everybody has to have a beta blocker. Hmm, affect the platelets? Yeah, so it's complex. But if we look at the history of coagulation, the APTT, here's a 1950s test um, from the University of North Carolina, and that's how they, that's actually how they ferreted out the intrinsic cascade was by trying to developed these tests, and it was useful for titrating low-dose heparin. That's what it was designed for, titrating low-dose heparin. Why do we think that a PT and an APTT, and we know everything we need to know preoperative about our patients, the PT, um, the QUIC test, Armin QUIC, built that in 1935. In 1935, he was trying to find a way to investigate von Willebrand's disease and Christmas disease because they showed up in Eastern European families 
and therefore he was trying to find a screening test. What does that have to do with heart surgery today? Absolutely nothing. So <clears throat> these tests were never conceived to predict or treat or guide bleeding therapy perioperatively, yet we've embraced them. And so, um, so how did I get involved? Well, TEG is absolutely in my blood. I got forced to, in my first job, um, go learn how to do liver transplantation surgery. My first job started in 1990, 1983. My boss, um, Tony Ivankovic, who's on this slide, said to me, hey, hey Spies, um, you got some good skills. Um, why don't you go learn how to do this new thing called liver transplants? So he sent me for two weeks to Pittsburgh, watched a lot of liver trans, got to know Ted Starzl and an anesthesiologist, Yugu Kang. Yugu had brought TEG from Hartert from Europe directly and said, we're going to follow coagulation changes during this surgery where they lose hundreds of units of blood and we can, we can follow it there. Well, I'll never forget standing in the operating room watching these guys bleed like stink. And I said, have any of you guys ever used this test for heart surgery? And they leaned over the drapes at me and they said, why would you do that? Heart surgery doesn't bleed like liver transplantation. And I said, true but we bleed in heart surgery. So I brought it back to try to use it for heart surgery. So I brought TEG back to heart surgery at Rush in Chicago in 1984. <clears throat> and I um, published the first group of articles about using TEG to predict bleeding after heart surgery. We, could, we found that it was 88% predictive of who would bleed after heart surgery. And we started guiding therapy with it. I then went and tried to send an application to the National Institutes of Health to say, hey, I got a new, a new technology that I think could influence and reduce bleeding after heart surgery. And they essentially wrote me back and said, why don't you lose, lose our address? You're an absolute idiot. Nobody, nobody will follow this technology because it's TEG. And in 1988, I came up for my first... Um, my first big promotion to associate professor, and I was blackballed by a hematologist who was sitting on, the, on my promotion committee, and she said, you will never be promoted at Rush University because you use TEG, and we all know TEG is garbage. Wow. Okay, so anybody here today think TEG is garbage? There are now thousands upon thousands upon thousands of papers based upon it. So Helmut Harter was a hematologist, and in the 1950s, he created this test to say that um, blood coagulation is not just a protein thing, it's a cellular thing. So he was way ahead of his time, and this is his actual first paper. And <clears throat> when he made it, there were all these gizmos and thingamajigs, and you had to put them together by hand, and you had to, um, you know, you had to balance the machine perfectly, and yeah, it, it was garbage in, garbage out. And if you didn't do it exactly right, you would get um, garbage data. And here's the thing. There wasn't an anesthesiologist in my department that would do it right and would QC it right. And that's why, you know, it got these really bad reputations because it was, it was near impossible to do the same thing the same time. So I've been involved with the development of these technologies all the way along. And in the you know, late 1990s, the the TEG 5000s came out, and most of you, uh, you know, are somewhat familiar with a trace um, about these sort of um, scud missiles or these, these sausages that get put out that have to do with clot strength over time. So all you're doing is looking at whole blood clot strength over time, and you can measure a number of different things off of them. And so <clears throat> it is now a standard test, in my opinion. When I made this slide, which was about five years ago, there were over 6,000 articles. There are now over 17,000 articles in the literature about TEG. Yeah, I guarantee you, if you go to the literature today, most of the literature starts off talking about TEG and talks about routine coagulation tests versus TEG. What's not routine? Do you need 18,000 articles? Do you need 25,000 articles? When does a test become routine and how many peer-reviewed articles do you need to have before we all stop calling it non-routine? It is routine. It is routine coagulation testing. And the Germans and the Europeans came out with a competitive one, which does essentially the same thing, Rotem. Um, they, unfortunately, I think have tried to emulate 
PTs and PTTs because they genuflected in front of that and said, oh, you know, <clears throat> hematologists understand PTs and PTTs. We ought to make a whole blood assay that can do that um, rather than focusing on what the technology can do. But the Rotems have had really good success as well. The Rotems are more robust. Um, you can't screw them up as an anesthesiologist as well as they're as easily as you can screw this up. And so I, over the years, have said, no anesthesiologist should ever touch a TEG 5000. They should be done either by perfusionists who are more um, regimented and oriented to QCing things than our anesthesiologists, or they should be done by lab medicine. And so, again, you can't read this, but what these, what these machines try to do is look at the shear modulus, the force that it takes for a clot to shear or pull apart as different levels of mechanical force are put to them. And you see that number G down there, that's, a, that's the shear modulus force and that's an actual physics equation. So when you get a number between zero to 100, that's a log, that's a log transformation of the actual shear force. And the shear force is what's really important to, um, clot strength. And so, but what do you get out of PTs, PTTs and stuff? You get less than a 50% accuracy of whether somebody's going to bleed or not. And I'm sorry, but I don't particularly want to send a bunch of lab tests off that, that I would do better flipping a coin. Um, so, and I'm certainly not going to guide my therapy based on those. So <clears throat> over the years, any number of different people have looked at, um, positive and negative predictive value. And I think um, certainly the negative predictive value has been pretty, pretty well established that if you have a normal TEG and somebody's not on Plavix, they're not on thiopyridine thi 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 molecules, aspirin, high dose aspirin, et cetera. Um, it's a pretty highly predictive that if you have a normal TEG and somebody's bleeding, it's because it's a surgical bleed. And to me, that's really useful. I can look over the drape at my surgeon and say, go find it. Um, you're not on these drugs. I haven't just given a bunch of cephalosporin. I haven't given this. I haven't given that. Um, go find your, your bleed. And 99% of the time, they find the bleed. So Par Johansson, a friend of mine who's in Denmark, um, is actually a hematologist in Denmark, has found out that there's 97% predictability by viscoelastic testing because of VHA and identifying a surgical cause of bleed postoperatively in over 3,250 patients. Well, that's really, that's really useful. Even if you can't say, I've got this TEG or I got that TEG, I got to give platelets versus cryoprecipitate. If you can say this one thing and help the surgeon say, um, um, go find it, that's worthwhile. So, as I said, many, many articles, there's actually been a Cochrane review. Uh, in one sense, um, maybe that says that it's routine testing. I mean, when you actually get a Cochrane review to review your literature, um, that says to me that there's a big volume of literature out there and somebody pay to pay attention to it. Don't I wish I could go back to the NIH right now and say, see, Anna Nana Poopoo, um, uh, I was right, you were wrong. Um, but that usually doesn't lead to anything good with the NIH. So we use a coagulation treatment algorithm. <clears throat> we get um, TEGs pre and post, and we get them pre-weaning. In other words, while the patient is rewarming and we're getting ready to come off. Um, once again, you can get these slides, but these are about to be outdated because we're about to um, run a side-by-side -side comparison between TEG and uh, TEG6S in our operating room right next to the next technology, which I'm gonna show you, which is the hemosonics machine. Um, so the algorithm makes a difference, and there've been some people who've published different algorithms. Linda Shore Lesserson essentially took one of my algorithms and made it better um, and published it in 1999. And um, so, um, and then other people have done even better. Kevin Karkudi has published other algorithms and um, compared one versus, I don't care whose algorithm you use. In all honesty, I want every hospital to, beauty about being at home, my wife brings me a glass of water. 
Um, so <clears throat> yet, um, I want every hospital amongst themselves to look at all their, their literature and say, hey, let's figure out our own algorithm. What makes the most sense to us? And so now we're, we have TEG6S in our hospital. We're about to move it from our laboratory down to the operating rooms. This is truly a standalone point of care device. It's simple enough that even an anesthesiologist can't screw up. Maybe a surgeon could, but not an anesthesiologist. So um, it's simple enough that we can run it and get reliable data. It QCs itself um, and it gives you some really pretty cool data, um, both about standard TEG measurements as well as uh, potentially fibrinogen. And you can do platelet mapping with it if you wanna use a platelet mapping cartridge. So <clears throat> is, this, is the standard, is everything on the 6S and the 5000, are they comparable? And, and the answer to that is yes, they are comparable. If you've been used to using um, 5000s in your lab and now you want to shoot to 6S, you can do that. And um, so this is a um, study out of Japan looking after um, protamine and platelet counts and stuff and fibrinogen levels. And lo and behold, it's, it's got pretty damn good accuracy for, um, for what those levels might be if you send them to a regular lab. I will tell you that the one uh, piece of literature that's out there that is extremely impressive is out of Germany, uh, um, Gerlinger's work where he's used Rotems and in simply a hundred patients by invoking his, and I won't show you his, his algorithm because his algorithm is so complex you'd need one of those computers of you know the 800 uh, 800 reactions to follow it but in so doing they actually reduce morbidity and mortality now i don't know how but it but it it passed muster for um for review um, that by by following their algorithm and using and by instituting thromboelastography guided therapy for severe bleeding. So that's severe bleeding. That's patients who are bleeding um, three or 400 cc's an hour in their ICU that they could decrease morbidity and mortality. So um, that's really impressive. In 100 patients, severe bleeding, just by following this, you can reduce morbidity and mortality. But as I said again, um, all these societies have called for viscoelastic testing, but we're only 30% of our, we're penetrations only 30%. So what the hell's the matter with all of us? Why do we not listen to what our societies say? Do we not, do we go to these meetings and just open up the transcranial passage and it goes right through and nobody adopts it? I mean, come on, we, we've got to get on board. So what's next? Um, this is what's next, I think. Um, but we're going to do a side-by-side -side comparison. We were ready to start our side-by-side -side comparison the week before COVID exploded in the United States. And my hospital said no outside uh, people coming in, no outside technicians coming in, nobody come in and coach you on how to teach and run these machines. So our side-by-side our -side comparison got put off until the worst of COVID goes away. So this is the Quantra by Hemasonics Incorporated, and it's a fascinating machine. And the TEG6S uses audible sound to um, look at clot. This uses ultrasound. And so ultrasound is very cool in that you can put these little cartridges into the machine. It's no touch. In other words, um, the blood goes into a <clears throat> vacutainer, a standard vacutainer that we would send off to the lab. The vacutainer goes into the machine. You and I don't have to pipette anything. No blood, no fuss, no muss. Um, and again, an anesthesiologist can't even screw it up. So it started at the University of Virginia with a bunch of people in the School of Engineering who were really into, um, they weren't hematologists, they were really into ultrasound. And they said, can ultrasound look at um, both solids and liquids? Of course it can. And so if you're Boeing Aircraft Corporation or Airbus, you examine the wings of your airplane or you examine 
the fan blades of your um, jet fan blades with ultrasound to look for minute cracks, etc. But if you want to understand the properties of a liquid, you can you can hit it with ultrasound and it resonates. And every liquid resonates at a different frequency and it returns a different frequency depending upon the composition of what's in the liquid <clears throat> and how viscous it is. So what they've done is they've designed this machine um, which does exactly that. And you have these reaction wells um, where ultrasound bombards and you have um, these little capillary tubes where various different reagents mix with the blood so you can activate the blood in any number of different ways. Then they even make it stupid capable. I mean, you can see where your patient is for um, clotting time and H stands for heparin. So are you green or are you red or are you yellow? So if, you're, if clotting time for heparin means that you're in the red range, you still have heparin on board. Overall clotting time is CT, clot strength is CS, platelet contribution to um, strength is, and then there's fibrinogen constant, fibrinogen contribution to clot strength is down on the lower right behind Will Harris's picture for me. Um, so <clears throat> you can get these numbers back out. So the basic paper about it just came out in 2016. Yeah, that's real new modern stuff. It just came out and talks about how the ultrasound uh, pings the blood sample, makes it ring, and as it rings, it reverberates and it transmits a, um, a sound back, and the shear modulus is the response of that clot as it gets pinged with more ultrasound. It actually comes out of some of the pinging that goes on in nuclear submarines in terms of sonar and nuclear submarines. So if you ping and you listen, and you ping and you listen, what do you hear coming back? And that's what it's doing, is looking to see um, what's happening to the clot as it goes on. These are the different buffers and stabilizers that are in the different channels. And from those, you, uh, you get those numbers that I said come out. Um, the beauty I think about it is it's an expandable platform and they're designing many more cartridges um, I've, I have challenged them to design a hit cartridge, and I think I can design it for them. So we could put blood in and find out whether somebody has hit antibodies or not. Um, and there's, so there's many, many ways. So right, right now they're working on one um, to look at any number of platelet um, surface activities, um, not just like a TEG platelet mapping, but as many different ways as they possibly can. Um, so <clears throat> there's, there's uh, studies are beginning to be um, published. Um, and so they're starting to come out in the literature as this is being adopted. Um, this is a study from our institution. We did 50 open heart surgery patients at VCU before I left there in 2015, 16. And we've showed that fibrinogen concentration, platelet counts, uh, fibrinogen versus um, what we had in clot stiffness between TEG, the G-force, et cetera. Um, there were reasonable correlation coefficients between all of them. And this was a group from up at UVA that did the same kind of thing, again, in heart surgery. They also did it in liver transplant surgery, um, found really tight correlations. And so it it tracks well. <clears throat> All of that meant that the FDA um, gave the go-ahead for um, uh, approval for it to be marketed, and now it's um, now it's being marketed. In cardiac surgery, the processing time for one test is 12 minutes. So um, maybe that's not as fast as an ACT, but it's damn close, especially if ACT on bypass with some heparin. So in 12 minutes, we can run it. Um, and now we have an in-room blood gas machine in our operating room, and we're going to have this right next to it um, if, if this does as well or better than the TEG-6. Um, <clears throat> uh, let me just move on. So these are some of those papers that I was talking about. Uh, got 510 approval. It's being utilized. Um, and now um, this is work from Italy, from Marco Ranucci in Milan. Um, God love him. He's been on the forefront of 
COVID-19 like nobody else. Um, but they've been using it for heart surgery and they've shown it to be highly effective in their hands for heart surgery as predicting. And these are their fibrinogen and platelet activity data um, comparing the Quantra data to actual fibrinogens and other, and other ways of assessing fibrinogen and platelets. So it seems to work. Um, <clears throat> other people in Europe are adopting it. I will tell you that there's now probably half a dozen, um, this is from Cambridge Papworth. Um, they were one of the early adopters and they're now using it for every heart surgery and they're guiding their therapy of transfusions and reducing their utilization of some of their blood products um, using the technique. The latest data came out two days ago, was also from Marco Renucci and a group in Milan, Italy, and they're using it in COVID-19. So this is really hot off the presses, hasn't even gotten to the presses yet. Um, I'm allowed to present it to you, but it's in print in Journal of Thrombosis and Hemostasis. And they've taken, I think about 46 COVID patients and followed them over time. And those COVID patients, um, as you go into the ICU and as your COVID infection gets worse and as your lung failure gets worse, you get a massive inflammation and you get a DIC. Um, no surprise to anybody, but um, the consumption, um, the clotting time um, doesn't change that much, but the platelet contribution to clot goes down. And so the stuff on the right was two weeks after entering the ICU. Stuff on the left is on entering the ICU. And you see that patients are going into profound um, pro-inflammatory, highly DIC, where they end up consuming. Their fibrinogen levels go way up, but they consume like crazy. So what's our plan in our operating room? We're going to train our anesthesia attendings and fellows. Um, we're not going to train surgeons. They'll never touch this stuff. Um, we're not going to train the perfusionists because perfusionists have too much else to do rather than just walking over and feeding this machine. But while you guys are on bypass, we can be feeding the machine. And as we come off bypass, we can be feeding this little machine. And we'll do TEG6s versus, um, versus the hemosonics machine. We'll get data acquisition from all of them, um, decide which ones um, are both most user-friendly, give us the most, the most actionable data. We want actionable data that people will react to um, and then we'll see which ones um, affect our outcomes. Um, and so there are now being algorithms published. <clears throat> this is an algorithm out of Mount Sinai in um, Miami, Florida. They were the first ones to adopt in the United States. And so their algorithm is out there as well as the one from Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I can, you guys can all have these slides. So, Viscoelastic testing that's available, TEG6S is point of care. The Rotem can be point of care. Um, places that use it point of care usually have it in a perfusion room. Um, they don't always, if they're using the Rotem, they don't always have it right in the operating room right next to the perfusionist. But I think the Quantra is definitely point of care. Um, other ones that aren't point of care, but are useful use of viscoelastic tests or the other ones of 5,000 multiplate PFA. And with that, um, I'm going to say Mother Nature is absolutely beautiful. Um, last year, I went to South Africa and Zimbabwe and Zambia and life changing. And if you ever have a chance uh, when the COVID virus isn't stopping us from flying, go there. Um, but the beauty about Mother Nature is its complexity. And the more I'm down in the weeds, the more I love the complexity. So marvel at it. And I'll take any questions anybody has. <clears throat>